Okay, what do we mean by uh, AI tours, actually? Uh, it's a specific set of tours, it's uh, online tours, so that means you usually have a web UI to interact with them, often uh, also an API, but so in general just web tours. And uh, a little bit in contrast to AI tours that have been around since forever, uh, the recent trend in AI tours has been focused more on generative AI. So what it means is that basically it takes a user input and uh, creates new data from that uh, by uh, enhancing the uh, input, adding, uh, creating new data, changing it a little bit and building on existing data. And you can roughly uh, categorize that by uh, the mediums wi with which they work on. Uh, for example, we have here uh, text, images, videos, speech and music. However, in this talk we're only going to be focusing on text and image tours uh, to keep the scope a little bit down and some more words about the scope in general. So the thing is, <laughs> since the two months ago when we submitted this talk, basically every other day uh, there was an announcement about some new uh, AI tool that is out there and that changes the game, uh, so forth and so on. So we really had to restructure a few times about what we want to focus on. And I think uh, what we came away with is that basically what we think has the highest end user impact is really GPT.4. So that's a model that's used in the chat GPT uh, tour. So that's going to be a big part of today's presentation. And something more uh, towards the goals. So what we want to do is we want to show some real life examples. So just some small tidbits of uh, what we found useful to do on our own in our, uh, when, working, uh, uh, yeah, when working on different problems. Then we go a little bit into the technical background on how those tools actually work to give a little bit of an intuition of what works well and what doesn't work well. And at the end, we're going to focus a bit more also on what alternatives are there, both in terms of open sourceness, but also at least uh, free alternatives. What is not a goal in this talk to keep the scope a little bit down is discuss uh, artificial general intelligence and the ethics that come along with it. We think that's a pretty important topic and a really interesting one, but it's uh, not going to be part of this talk. And also, we're not going to talk a lot about data privacy. Equally important, uh, just a small advice is basically to assume the worst. So what I mean with that is, if you enter data in any of those tools, you should definitely be aware that they are readable by people at the company that operate them. And it is likely that they will be used for further training. So you kind of indirectly may publish your data. So heads, heads up. <laughs> Okay, so the first part is uh, text generation and uh, ChatGPT. So let's dive right into it. What is it? It's basically just a chatbot. And it also has been around for a while. So already in November last year, there were the first uh, beta access there. Um, but what happened mid of March was the release of the newest model. Uh, so the model on which ChatGPT operates on, the, the four model. And we really think this has been a game changer. Also related, I want to give a shout out to a recent talk that was called Sparks of Artificial General Intelligence. And we really think that's a, an amazing presentation uh, to have a look at. And I think what happened there is basically it changed the uh, uh, usefulness of the tool from being useful every once in a while and has some nice cool examples where you can do things uh, better to being pretty much consistently useful whenever you try to do something with it. So, yeah, a small, but, uh, a small difference, but big impact. And there is a free tier for this, but it only has the, uh, the older tool, the, uh, the older model, the GPT 3.5, and it's often not available. A lot of the free tiers and these uh, big uh, AI tools out there, they are, um, they, are, they are sometimes not available when there's heavy load, for example, on the weekends or on American business hours. <laughs> Okay, how does it look like? I'm sure uh, a lot of you have seen it already, but just so you know, it's basically you open up the web page, you're immediately there with some chat interface, you can select uh, the model you want uh, to talk with, and you just type away, and yeah, just, just some stupid example doesn't really produce interesting output here, but just to see how the user interface looks like and how you uh, work with it. So some hopefully more interesting uh, examples. So starting off with something small, this is an example I had in uh, work where basically I used an external API and I got back some enum values that represented some credit cards and I thought, okay, I need this in a human readable way. So I just uh, pasted it in there and said, give me a JavaScript uh, dictionary with the human readable names next to it. And I just did that like in seconds. 
So it doesn't save a lot of time here, but it does uh, it, it does save time. And if you imagine like that not being five enum values or something, but 10 or 20, you save a lot more time. And it's kind of nice that it really got, it really understood <laughs> what was meant by the enum values just by having the general knowledge of credit cards and what that shortcuts there mean. Yeah. A little bit more involved, um, again, related, <laughs> this example comes from the same day of working. Um, uh, it, but unit tests in general, I think, is one of the most uh, potential, uh, one of the places with the most potential to save a lot of time because you can really first explain the setup in English or German, what you want to test there, what it's supposed to do. Then you provide maybe the snippet of the class you want to work with, maybe one or two connected classes. And then you say, okay, generate me some unit tests. And you can have a look at the code and then just reiterate and say, yeah, okay, but I also want to test that does this and that. Um, so it's some small example he here. Uh, it's again with the credit cards, um, provided some example values and they had a formatter where basically you get either the first six digits of a card or the last four or both. And depending on what you get, uh, it's a different format and it's called different ways. And it just produced me the the output, this is some, some very simple test, but you, you, you get the idea. It basically tries every permutation there is. It does a good job of naming the test actually correctly, so it has a semantic uh, understanding of what I typed in in the original question and uh, uses that in the naming of the test functions. And yeah, it's at least a great starting point, especially if you have to write a lot of them, and then you can just generate them and then refine a little bit further on. Okay. A little bit more involved, so another wall of text, but this time I don't think you really have to, <laughs> to, to, to read it. It's more to illustrate basically the example that we had a super weird bug with an iOS app where we open up a web view and that opens up another app and it crashes. So, okay, uh, I just typed that in basically here and said, okay, what is going on? And then it pointed me towards the right places in code and said, okay, you need to prevent this or that didn't really work out actually but what is cool is that you can have a conversation so later on I dove into something like very technically and said okay the one event handler that you said I should use it doesn't work why can that why is that the case and then it says okay because in your frame in your case you have an iframe and a redirect and in that case you can't do it that way but you do it have to do it a different way so it's really for more convoluted examples it's uh, it's a great helper. It's like a Stack Overflow on steroids, where you can basically just tell it w what you actually mean, and it has some kind of semantic understanding of uh, of how to approach these things. Uh, this is <laughs> my, my my favorite example. Um, shouldn't have favorites, but I do. So I thought, okay, they can't produce images, but what they can produce is text, right? So SVG is text. So I can uh, produce images by uh, saying, uh, draw this in SVG. So I went there and said, okay, give me a cat. And he gave me this. <laughs> and it's, okay, fair enough. It's, it's not a great painter. It doesn't do a good job of actually painting cats. But the thing is, what it's actually good at is like not creatively, but uh, more text-based. So what I did, this is basically the data from the, the second slide I think I showed you, or the third one, about all the releases in the AI field, and I just pasted it in there and said, uh, make me a nice timeline. And uh, again, it came out with a suggestion. It was okay. But uh, a similar story than before with the debugging thing, you can just iterate with it. So like I kept asking it, okay, now, the line go is too long, get rid of that, the circles are too small, give me some colors, then the colors, they are a bit too bright, so make them more professional looking. <laughs> and uh, this is basically the evolution of that, that the free request you can see here. So it's basically by just typing that, it uh, adjusted the output accordingly. And yeah, this is basically, you can see the line getting drawn correctly, the, the colors changing a little bit. So I think this is lots of potential to make some of these data visualization tasks, tasks a little bit easier. And then if you change your mind and you just want it as an HTML page, you can just say, okay, now give it to me in HTML with uh, alternating row colors, so forth and so on, and you instantly have it. So with those kinds of tasks, it saves you a lot of, of uh, typing work, basically. Exactly. And, ah, yeah. and so what do we learn from this? Surprised by my own slides, <laughs> because I had to adjust them recently again. So some uh, prompting guides here. 
Um, so I think the first, the most important thing to take away from all of this is to write uh, like you would write to a smart person. So write in sentences, don't give like just individual words, just tell it, give it context uh, like you would with a, with a coworker, for example. And then some uh, alternative, uh, 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 another suggestion is you can uh, use styles. You can copy um, text that you have written or someone else has written as an input and then say, okay, now use the style that was used here to generate some more. Or you can formulate your own style. I have some um, example down here when the last line I say, also you're from the 18th century. And just that little sentence there at the end changes the uh, generated output text to be like, a little more old-fashioned, I would say. So that's that's useful. Uh, rate my prompt is something you can add basically to any prompt. And what it does is it basically gives you feedback on your question and what was unclear about it and how you could improve your prompt writing in general. So here, this one was already pretty specific. So I had like a complicated dinner setup with four people each having their own allergies and whatnot. And uh, it gave me some examples, and at the end it said, okay, it was a, a 9 out of 10 because it had everything in there, but it really helps you if something is missing. Uh, coding support, just some quick, quick ones. Sometimes the output is truncated. You just type continue, and it will continue the truncated output. It also gives you a lot of explanation before and after outputting code, and if you're really into a session of just wanting the output uh, and not the explanation, you can just uh, in the first line tell it output only the code and it speeds things up a lot. And also what's quite nice is that sometimes you have to, uh, you see already when it starts typing, it didn't get the question correctly. So if you also in the initial uh, prompt just add ask for clarification before giving an answer, you can avoid that a lot because it will then change the behavior a little bit to first ask you questions about things that are unclear. Yeah, and then uh, some more general tips, roles and personas. For example, you can say, be my interviewer for this job position and then paste ba uh, basically the, the job position output that's so on the internet, but in general, the roles, personas thing that works quite well. And what's really good for more complex tasks is uh, examples for input-output. That's a technique called few-shot prompting. And that is especially if you want some, if you have some more complicated setup of questions where you have lengthy outputs. And if you just take the time to basically write, here are some examples, input, output, that really elevates the, the output oftentimes. And the last one, let's think step by step that prompts it to write out its reasoning. You can see an example here where it's asked the, the same question two times uh, for the prime numbers between 150 and, uh, and 250. The first one is wrong. And the second time the answer, uh, the question is rephrased in a way so that it is to first output the actual numbers and then give the answer and then gets it right. Although I have to say, I noticed in the last two weeks, it seems to do that on its own mostly now, but still maybe for some cases that is still a useful tip to just uh, yeah, ask it to do that. Also why that happens is something we will uh, also now see uh, in the technical description of the ChatGPT model. And for that, I would hand over to my colleague, Johanna. Cool, thanks. Okay, so... Um the technical background is really meant to give you an intuition about how the model works, how a model can be trained in general, and also how the architecture of the models that ChatGPT is based on looks like. And I'm hoping that in this process, um, I will also answer some frequently asked questions about how does the model do certain things and why is it so bad in doing some other things that we don't really expect if we don't know how it works. So all that we have seen up until this point is the like API or web interface, uh, ChatGPT. Um, we give it a prompt, so an input, and then uh, we receive some output answer of the web interface. And of course, there is like a an AI model in the background, which is the ChatGPT model. And this is what um, I want to take a deep dive now. Um, but first, we will start um, with the basics. So how does a model train in general? And is this, this is also the same for other neural network-based models. Um, but I will like 
give this intuition with the example of language models. So we have three phases. The first one is the so-called unsupervised pre-training phase. Um, in the beginning, we do have a model that's already specified in terms of architecture. So we like the, the model architecture is predefined, but it does have a large amount of trainable parameters that are not yet trained or anything, but they are uh, initialized randomly. So if we input our first question to the model, um, we will get some random output because it hasn't learned anything. So what we have to do now is, um, like in the training process, present this large language model um, with text. And typically here, the objective is to predict the next token. So on the right side, you can see one example for a text. So you have one sentence, and then you can construct multiple um, input examples for the training. Um, and the objective is to predict the next token. So the input will be like some part of the sentence and the next token of this input sequence will be the target that we want the model to predict. Um, in practice, um, the data that's used for training is actually just a very large amount of random data. So this can be from the internet, from books or other text sources. Um, and then in the training process, we like let the model predict some output and we know what, what the target is, so what we would expect the model to output. Um, and this is what we use in combination with the model output in order to compute the error. And the error is some numerical representation of how close the model output is to the target that we desired or how wrong it is. So based on this error, we can use um, numerical optimization algorithms in order to update these trainable parameters of the model. And we do this for many, many, many steps, so like millions of steps. And then at some point we have the so-called pre-trained model, which is a version that has updated the weight in such a way that the output actually resembles the target that we wanted the model to predict. Then we have the second phase. So typically you have like, or you may have fine-tuning phases, you may have several of them, and this really depends on the model and the objective. Um, but here the idea is that um, now you want to um, specialize your model on a very specific application. So in this case, this would be a chat-like conversational behavior. So what you do is basically the same thing as before, but you change the data that you're feeding the model. So this time you have an input, which is a question, and then you have a target, which is like a proposed answer to this question. So you tell the model what would be a good answer to this question. Um, and again, you do this like error computation and weight update step. And then at some point you have your like fine-tuned model that is finalized, and then there is the prediction step. So here we don't update anything anymore. This is what we also use for production or the chat GPT that you're using when you enter something uh, in the web uh, interface. Um, you present an input to the model and you get some response that's hopefully useful for the user. So let's take a deeper look at the model architecture. Um, and here um, there are several variants of how large language models could look like, um, but the state of the art language models are all based on GPT for text generation and um, the transformer models, which is really like the basic model architecture that's typically used nowadays. Um, so the GPT stands for Generative Pre-trained Transformer. Um, and on the right side here, you can see like a high level depiction of how this looks like. So uh, GPT has um, multiple so-called decoder layers, um, where each of these decoder layers has like some inner components, um, but every decoder layer looks more or less the same, but the trainable parameters are different. So they will learn different things. And you can also think about this as like a, a hierarchical structure, where the like lower layers will see different data, so they will operate on the input data itself, but then higher layers already have like some pre-processed features that they are operating on, so they can learn different things. Um, and so we present this model with a text, an input, and then we propagate all those like tokens or words, and for now you can think as tokens to be the equivalent of words. Um, we process this through all the decoder layers until we have 
the next word that we are predicting. Um, and in the next step, we feed back the word that we just predicted into the input of the model and then do the same thing for the next word and so on. So this is what we call an autoregressive model because the prediction of like a later output of the model also depends on an earlier output that the model gave us. And there are many variants of GPT, um, but they're mostly the same architecture and they're just varying the size. So they have a different number of parameters and also they were trained on a different number of tokens, so the input data. Um, and just so that you like understand how many 500 billion tokens are that are used for training, for example, for GPT-3. So this would be like 1.6 millions of uh, books of Game of Thrones or more than 16 times the whole content of Stadtbibliothek Graz with all its seven locations. So a lot of data. Um, yeah, so how does a decoder layer look like? Um, there are like two main components, the feed forward layer and the self attention layer. And the feed forward layer is basically the component that's like the classical language model. So um, it's responsible for predicting the probability of one token given the input sequence of tokens. And then the attention layer is here because um, it's not so easy if you have to pay attention to all the input sequences. Um, it's sometimes hard to, to kind of focus on the parts that are important. And you can think of self-attention as the part that gives us like a, a like it pre-processes the data so that we focus on the right things. Um, in the example on the left, you can see here a, a sentence as an example. So the animal um, doesn't cross the street because it was too tired. Um, so for example, if you look at the word it, um, it may correspond to the animal or to the street. Um, but the word it itself doesn't say much. It's just because of the context that we know these things. And then we additionally have the information that it was too tired. So we as humans would know, okay, it must be the animal because the street isn't tired. Um, and this is also something that the attention mechanism is very useful for. Also, if you think about input sequences that are very long, like a thousands of tokens, but for the next word, probably not all those thousand tokens are really important to predict the next word, but just some parts. And this also depends on the context of this current token that you want to predict. Um, so then there is like another uh, component that's really important. It, it's related to how the data is represented to the model or prepared for the model. Um, so this is what we call the tokenizer and the embedding. So you have words or tokens as the inputs. They're then converted to a numerical representation. So for example, just an ID of the token um, of all the tokens that are known to the model. And then in the embedding space, you convert this to something like a semantic representation of uh, your token, which means that you have a vector representation where tokens that are semantically close to each other should also be close in embedding space. And tokens that are far from them in a semantic way should be very far in the embedding space. So in this example, we have like an apple, a pear, and a stone. And you can think about like the each dimension of this vector is some like implicit property of the words that you are learning. And these properties could, for example, be is it edible, how durable is it, or what's the appearance like. Um, so for example, for the apple and pear, we would expect that they would be quite close in embedding space because they are both like edible, not very durable if you throw them on the floor. And they also look similar. But for example, the stone would be quite far from this because it's very durable, but you can't eat it. Um, and this is really the part that gives the model kind of the understanding or like, yeah, the understanding of what words actually mean. And then we also need some positional um, encodings because all those tokens are processed in parallel and we need to remember where they were originally. And then we have like multiple of these um, decoder layers um, where each decoder layer is like the same thing. Um, and the number of decoder layers also depends on the model variant. Um, so for example, for GPT-2, that would be between 12 and 48 of those layers stacked. Um, and then for the outputs, um, we have an unembedding and a softmax step. And this will then give us 
something we can interpret as a probability that the next token would be the one at this position. So we can then take the maximum, so we would have the um, most probable next token, or we could also sample from those probabilities and then get a non-deterministic output of the model. So it will give us a different output, or it may give us a different output every time we run the same sentence. And then in the next step, um, as I mentioned before, um, the output is then fed back to the model uh, input, and then everything starts again uh, for the next word, including the information that we just predicted out of the model. Um, Okay, so this was like how GPT works. And this is like the basis for all those language models. And then we have ChatGPT, which behaves quite differently. Because if you think about it, it doesn't, it doesn't just um, predict the next word, but it really gives us a useful answer. And it does this in a very interesting way. Also, sometimes if you ask it something weird, it says something like, oh, I'm an AI model. I can't answer this. Um, so this is also not like a useful next token, but there are like some other steps involved. And we have basically three steps for like the basic variant of ChatGPT that we know of, but for sure there are also some other tricks to do during training. Um, so the first step is something that you already know. It's like the fine tuning we have had in the very first example. So. Um, it's called like the supervised fine tuning where humans label the response so they like manually write out the response that you would expect from a model from a specific um, prompt. And then the model is fine tuned on those uh, prompt and response pairs. And then in the next step, um, the model is, all, uh, is again presented with a prompt and it predicts several answers to this one prompt. And then a human labeler ranks those answers from best to worst. And this information is then used to train a second neural network model that then predicts the quality of the prompt. So the goal of this model is to predict how good those responses were, and the target is the ranking that the human gave. And then in the third step, um, the model is again asked to um, predict a response for a prompt, and then um, the reward model, which is the model that um, we trained in the second step, is then used to um, predict the quality of this response. Um, and then the reward, so the quality of the response, is then um, used in a reinforcement learning strategy to further um, fine-tune uh, or train the model. And this is basically how ChatGPT was trained. Now, I would like to mention some issues also that are known um, for ChatGPT and similar models. So we have already seen that it's very good in like, like uh, summarizing questions, um, reiterating multiple times, understanding what you ask with respect to some earlier questions and so on. But there are also some sometimes surprising issues. Um, so one thing um, that was in the news quite often, I would say, is like it, it just makes up things sometimes or hallucinates. Um, and then also you don't really have a very good indication of how certain the model is of specific outputs. Um, and um, also there is um, like no means of actual references in the text. And also for um, reasoning or like more complex reasoning and math and physics questions, um, it sometimes doesn't give you the answer that, that you would want to have. Um, and I believe that um, like most of these issues come from the very nature of how the model is trained. So because it is an autoregressive model and the, the objective in this pre-training step is really to predict the next token. And this sometimes makes it very hard, for example, to do reasoning steps over like many lines and reason many steps ahead or plan ahead. Um, and also, of course, depending on the data, there might be some wrong information in it. Um, so it might hallucinate things that in this context don't really exist. Um, and here's one, I would say, very simple example that shows that of this autoregressive nature of the model. So if you ask it, okay, how many words does my question contain? It confidently answers with the right uh, number of words. But then if you ask it, okay, how many words does your response have? 
it doesn't know because at the time where it outputs the number, how many words the response has, it doesn't know yet because it's just going to predict until the end of the sentence. Um, and then sometimes it also fails in some very surprising ways where we would say, okay, this is like a computer model. Why can't it do like simple computations? That's weird. And also if you ask it some like more up-to-date information or something that would be like, you could Google this thing, the model doesn't really know, but it does know some other surprising things. And there the reason is really that it doesn't use any external tools. So it doesn't like the base version of ChatGPT without any additional plugins, doesn't have um, internet access, it doesn't have a calculator. So it's able to do like basic computations, but if you ask it something numerically a bit more demanding, like what's something to the power of some other number, um, it just answers something wrong. And it doesn't also doesn't indicate like, I'm not certain what that is, it just outputs something wrong. Um, and then also, like I also mentioned before, there's like no up-to-date information. And the reason for this is that the training cutoff date was uh, in 2021. So you won't find any information that's newer than this, um, except for very specific things that were then later on, like again, it was trained in a more fine-tuning step, but in general, that's the cutoff date. Um, and then, um, about memory, so it's quite um, interesting that it can memorize specific things and iterate over multiple questions and answers. Um, but then also this just works for, so the reason why this works is actually because we have a specific sequence length or context length, so the maximum number of inputs you can feed the model. Um, and there is like a specific number how many you have, so it's like 4,000 for the basic version of ChatGPT. So you can do all these things up until this length, but if you have a longer input, it just doesn't work anymore. Um, and this is also the question of like the like working memory of the context versus some external memory, which the model doesn't have. And then uh, there is like a safety API around it, and usually you shouldn't be able to prompt the model for like problematic things in general. Um, but then especially when it was released, there were some like prompt hacking attempts um, where people made the model tell them things it wasn't supposed to tell them just because they were like saying things like, okay, let's play a role game. Uh, you're a character that wants to build a bomb and then the model answered something that it usually wouldn't. Um, but to be honest, I think most of these things are kind of fixed and um, it's actually really hard to kind of jailbreak the model at the moment anymore. Um, yeah, and then there's the question of human bias. So obviously if you have data, the model then like incorporates this bias in, in the model itself. Um, and I think this is um, also interesting because um, this model has also this like human feedback. Um, but in general, that's the case with um, machine learning models. And I think if the, like, if the data is diverse and the group that's labeling is diverse, it hopefully shouldn't be such a problem. And then also these models are very large because they have a large size. So it's very demanding in terms of compute resources. And sometimes it's not so easy for like private people uh, or smaller companies to actually like run or even train or like to train them. It's really hard, um, but even to run, it's sometimes not so easy. Um, yeah, that's my part. Okay, thanks so much. So now I'm going to have a, a quick um, overview of some alternatives that there are. So are there even alternatives to this? Because the big models, uh, the big companies put in tons of money into this and it's very hard to replicate. But there are some interesting uh, developments uh, or in recent times. I think the, the first started with something called Llama. <laughs> what is Llama? It's, uh, it stands actually for large language model of Meta AI. So it's the, from the company Meta, they released a so-called foundation model. So that is one of those that basically did the, 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 the they have a, a no fine tuning yet, as you saw in the previous technical explanation, but they already are some, they have some uh, language knowledge in there. So it's an alternative to the GPD model. And soon, uh, initially also only the source code for this was released. But a week after, the whole model, like the trained model, already also was leaked. So, uh, but based on that, a lot of stuff happened in the uh, academic and open source community. So soon after, the University of Stanford released something called Alpaca, 
which took the base model of Llama. So they all they used the Llama themed names. I don't know, but it's kind of cute, I think. They uh, created a bucker, and what they did is they uh, used OpenAI's API to generate instructions. And with the, those generated instructions, they fine-tuned the Llama model. So they kind of used the capabilities that OpenAI uh, published to fine-tune a model that also then had some pretty good results. And the authors of Vicuña took it one step further. So they used a platform called ShareGPT, where people can voluntarily upload their conversations to that. And they took like 70,000 uh, conversations from there and they used that to fine-tune the Llama model. And they claimed that uh, in 90% of cases, it works as well as ChatGPT, so the, the order 3.5 model. But still, the, uh, looking at that all this is out for like a month, it's quite uh, nice to see how, how much you can do with it already. And those, they run your local machines and they used the computing resources that cost about $500 for each of those to train them. Though, admittedly, they built up in uh, existing data, of course. There's another model that's out there called GPT-4R uh, that builds on another different foundation model and that also has like a one-click installer, Docker image, how-tos out there, so it's really easy to get into. And also want to shout out uh, um, Hacking Face, so that's an online community and also some SDK that uh, that basically release that uh, you can access lots of existing source code and how to build models there and uh, also uh, pre-trained models uh, are available there so that's a great community to get started there okay free alternatives so not open source the image i just entered microsoft versus google and that came out so good enough i guess well, so what are free alternatives so you have bing chat that also has been in the news recently but i think it got better and better over the weeks and I think that is very soon something that is also very, very useful to use and it's completely free. And there's also an alternative from Google that's called BART, but so far as I know, it's currently only available in the US and the UK. So yeah, those are the current state of the alternatives. And now a quick look at a little bit different field, not so in-depth, but just want to show you some, like, some, some tools you can use there. So this whole thing started off basically with Dolly. It was also in the autumn of last year, I think. And it was uh, in the news back then. And suddenly you could input anything you want to see and it created images. If that's hitchhiking squirrels, four pineapples, or a toast, uh, avocado playing an a concert in front of toasts, everything was possible now. But it was not super advanced. I had this slide here, but since of last week, I basically removed it now because it kind of got integrated into Bing Create. So that is now a separate web page that's offered by Microsoft. If you uh, go there, you can access basically the same capabilities. Is it mine? Yeah. No, sorry. <laughs> so that basically offers the same capabilities as uh, Dolly, and it uh, has much less free credits per month. So you can do 100 image generations there. And soon you can just exit direct, uh, access it directly from Bing Chat. So that's also very useful to use. So also the video here, how it looks like using it, it's super simple. You basically open up the page, post in some prompt you want to see. There's a, quite a different sort of prompt you have to use for the image creation models. It's not the same as ChatGPT, but there's a lot of to know in here. So you can experiment a lot with describing art styles, color themes, uh, and uh, a lot of parameters there. Here, I just have some a super simple example of a penguin in Graz in watercolor. You can see the output there. It's also it's pretty good already, I think, and it's completely free. And then, last but not least, uh, Mid Journey. So I think that's the the best one currently. Um, yeah, and it's unfortunately the free trial stopped uh, already because they said it was used too much for uh, abusive content. So it's not uh, available anymore for free. Yeah, but it's uh, currently, I think I'm just going to skip this video. It's basically the same thing, except it uses a Discord bot to create the images. So, and some examples there we actually used in the work. We have some four or four pages where content was not found. So a colleague of mine, Nico Müller, actually created a tool to manage uh, lunch orders. And if something wasn't found, he created this sad looking toast there. And also there's another image over on the right for if some a customer tries to access a receipt he has and it isn't found. You have some printer there printing some receipts so that was used in the work. And there's only one open source alternative, but it is a good one. It's called Stable Diffusion. 
it's by default not the best, I would say, in creating the images you request from it, but it has really a lot of parameters to tinker with, and there's an endless variety of uh, how-tos and Docker images out there. The repository down there is one uh, that uh, offers like a one-click install. You can get it running on any operating system and just try and experiment with it. Yes, and I think that was it already. <laughs> so thanks so much for listening to our talk. I have some honor honorable mentions uh, up there that couldn't make it into the talk. And yeah, that's basically it. It's open for questions now. Thank you. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah, um, so I think it's not, ah, okay, so I have to repeat the question. Um, okay, so um, the question is because of the cutoff date of 2021, how does it actually work? And is there something like a filter that detects that this is information that requires something from after 2021? Um, so I think like it's, as far as I know, it's not really public knowledge what what exactly they do. So in general, they do have like a lot of like small things around the API stuff they filter beforehand and things like this that are not really known. Um, but I personally don't think that this is really the case also because it's sometimes not, not very clear um, if that's the case, but you do get some indication of um, okay, um, for example, for, for topics that are known to change uh, over time, um, you sometimes get something like, um, okay, this is what I know about this topic, but it might have changed because my training stopped in 2021. 20, so it doesn't, it, so it does actually tell you that, like, there might be new information out there. Um, yeah, so for example, I also like ask, okay, what's Austrian's uh, chancellor? And then it tells you, uh huh, uh, Sebastian Kurz, um, but this might be out of date. So you would know. Yeah, um, so I don't think they trained it on all the data. So I do think like you do have like many, uh, okay. <laughs> so the question was, <laughs> um, um, uh, this gentleman heard that um, actually the, it would be too slow to connect the model to the internet. And this is also why they trained it kind of on the internet um, so that it has the knowledge of the internet without needing to like query uh, the internet. Um, and um, I would say, in general, the internet is a very like large corpus of text that's definitely useful and does contain a lot of information. I don't think the model was trained on the whole internet, um, but like specific parts of it. So I do think there's like information from specific websites or companies, for example, that the model just doesn't know because it wasn't included in the training data. And in general, like the general information, I totally agree. I think the model does have very good capabilities of like compressing information into these weights that it learned. Um, and then it can like give you this information, so it doesn't need the internet for everything. Um, but there are certainly things that the internet would be useful. And also, if you think about um, like if the model is used for a longer time, you would want this model to kind of stay up to date with things that are happening. Yeah. And also, Bing Chat already has access to the internet, so it was not trained on it, but you can at least look up stuff on there. So that's also some alternative you have. <laughs> okay, mm. so the question was, um, you, um, so we mentioned that the model is trained using human interaction and um, like how many people are involved in this process and how do you do this, who is doing this? 
Um, so I think the answer is we don't know exactly how many people were involved in this. We do know that OpenAI, the company behind ChatGPT, spent a ton of money into paying people that do the labeling. Um, so like they really have employees that do this for them. And I think they also have like training in order to not like give bias to the model um, and a lot of things like how to formulate um, their responses and things like this. Um, and I mean, I do agree that if you don't have a company with that much money, it's really hard to get this done. So for example, if you think about open alternatives, this would be a very hard task to like get the quality of the data that OpenAI got from the labelers. Um, yeah, but I guess someone is going to solve this. Um, okay, I think we have to end here with that. Uh, but if someone has uh, follow-up questions, I suggest just uh, come up to us and ask us. So we are happy to answer some more follow-up questions. Uh, thanks again. Thank you. Thanks.